it's time for RTB 101, where we discuss practical questions to equip you to share your faith more effectively. And here to help me talk about a very important worldview question is my colleague, philosopher, and theologian, Kenneth Samples. Welcome back, Ken. Hi, Krista. Glad to have you here. You know, we are both theologians, but we work with a lot of scientists and reasons to believe we, we like to explore that, that area of overlap between the latest scientific discoveries and what we read in the scriptures. Now, I'm sure that many in our culture kind of find our position a little odd. Uh, you know, they might be thinking, how can you affirm the advances of scientific discovery on the one hand and be a historic Christian on the other hand? Maybe we could talk about that a little bit. Yeah, I find uh, what's very helpful for me, and I, I think it's helpful when I share it with others, Krista, is Christians believe in two books. Now, it's not the two books like you would have in Islam, where you'd have the Quran and the Bible, and it's, it's not like Mormonism, where you have the Book of Mormon and the Bible. Rather, we have two books, the Book of Nature, which is a figurative book, and then we have the literal book of Scripture. So Christians through the centuries, and, and this, this idea of two books, it precedes even St. Augustine. So it's pretty early in church history that there's the book of nature that God authored, and there's the book of Scripture that God authored. And when we interpret those two books, the data we would get from the natural sciences or from history or philosophy, and we compare that to Scripture, if we interpret them properly, God speaks and he speaks consistently. And so RTB, Reasons to Believe, has adopted that, that uh, fundamental Christian idea of the two books approach to Revelation. So we're really trying to kind of find this, this third way of not merely looking at the science or not merely looking at the Bible, but, but really trying to see how both of these can reveal the Creator um, so we have a high view of, of science. Now, I'm hearing more and more on my social media feeds about a term called scientism, and that's a little bit of a new term for me. Um, and it, it seems like in the context, it, it's a little different than just being an advocate for good science, which is what we do at Reasons to Believe. So maybe you can help me understand this term scientism. Is there a yeah. basic definition we could discuss? Yeah, that's a very important uh, point you're making there. So, so let's start with science. Science is really a, a practice. It is observing the natural world and drawing information. Scientists develop hypotheses and they, they test these models to, to see if they are confirmed. Uh, and so science is then largely a practice of gaining uh, knowledge and understanding of the natural world. Scientism is a broad-based philosophy. Scientism is not merely a practice. Scientism, for example, would say that the natural world is all there is. I mean, that's a philosophical statement. And they would often say, depending on whether you have kind of a hard or soft scientism, a hard scientism would say, the only way you can get real knowledge and truth is through science. A soft scientism would say the best way to get knowledge is through science. See, whereas at RTB, we believe we can get knowledge through science, but we also believe that knowledge and information and truth comes through other uh, venues, such as revelation, uh, such as philosophy. So the difference is scientism is a secular philosophy of life. Science is a practice of understanding the natural world. That's really helpful. And, and so it kind of almost sounds like you're taking science as a study of the natural world and, and then turning it more into a worldview. You're applying it to other things, the nature of reality and what's real and what's not. Would that be a way of thinking about it? Yeah, no, that's that's right on target. I mean, if you if you look, listen to Richard Dawkins, or if you listen to, uh, you know, often very controversial and outspoken atheists, 
they will sometimes, uh, Stephen Hawking is a good example. Uh, they will tell you, for example, that the material world is all there is. Now, they don't know that. There's nothing in nature that tells you the, the material world is all there is. Or they'll say statements like the, the, you know, the absolute determiner of truth comes through experimental science. But the, but the problem is, is experimental science doesn't tell you that. So it is a philosophy, and it extends much further than just your standard uh, scientific investigation of the natural world. Well, that sparks my thinking back a little bit historically, because some would say, you know, the scientific revolution that, that happened with, with Galileo turned our attention away from the Bible to scrutinizing nature, you know, that, that we've advanced past looking at for divine revelation, for, for information about the natural world. And I know that many people in our culture have a concern that about whether or not Christians can even be a responsible scientist, you know, if they're a Christian. Um, do scientists need to buy into scientism as a worldview in order to do good science? Do you have any thoughts about that? Yeah, I would say no. Um, there are many people that are outstanding scientists who don't happen to buy the worldview of scientism. I mean, you mentioned Galileo. Galileo was a very conservative Roman Catholic, and he had a high view of scripture. He had a, a high view of truth that can be discovered uh, through the sciences. So I would say that uh, not only can you be a good scientist and not buy into the secular worldview of scientism, but that scientism has all kinds of inherent uh, problems and difficulties. I mean, again, uh, nothing in nothing in science tells you the natural world is all there is, and uh, you cannot get out of an experiment that you should only trust knowledge that comes through an experiment. So there there are some incredibly good scientists who don't embrace scientism, but rather believe that there is knowledge available in theology, in philosophy. Uh, in the social sciences. When we're talking to our non-Christian friends, I'm trying to kind of think of, you know, what their pushback might be. And one of the things that sort of comes to me is that, well, doesn't adopting a Christian worldview actually stifle science? I mean, it, it's almost like scientism and, and Christianity, couldn't they be seen as worldview competitors? Because science is helping us overcome world hunger and and bring about innovations to eliminate disease through medical resource, uh, research, doesn't scientism actually offer a better hope than, than Christianity about improving our quality of life? Well, the first thing I would say is that uh, the, the study of the natural sciences is one of the most incredible enterprises that human beings have come uh, have been able to accomplish. And so I think Christians that have a real sincere respect for science, science and technology has brought a lot of good to humanity, uh, extended our life uh, span, etc. Uh, however, um, Christianity was the worldview that produced science. I mean, there, science and uh, scientific ideas kind of sp sparkled at different places through the centuries, the Greeks, the Romans, uh, etc. But the scientific revolution took place in the middle of the 1600s, and it took place in Christian Europe. So the vast majority of the early scientists were Christian, and Krista, the, the presuppositions, that is, these philosophical ideas that go into the practice of science, things like there's a real world out there, I can trust my cognitive faculties and sensory organs, math and logic are valid, there's real order in the world, all of these presuppositions fit really well with what I would call a Judeo-Christian or biblical worldview. So you can't do science without adopting a worldview. And I think the worldview that best fits is, is Christianity, which produced it in the, in the beginning. Very good. Very thoughtful discussion. Thank you for your help, Ken, in thinking that through. And I do want to encourage all of our viewers to go check out Ken's blog, it's called Reflections, and you can access that by going to the reasons.org website 
and search for Reflections. <laughs>